This is James Milton Cherry. This is a very young picture of him. I wonder if it was taken when he was at Eastman School of Business. This is a very rare photograph of him because you see him straight on. And most of the times through the years, most of the photographs later on will be of him actually this side, left side. And it is because he got into an accident with a mule and the mule took his eye out. So, yes, so that is why he, you don't see pictures like this of head on. Anyway, um, let's see, I just wanted to do this to give you kind of an idea. We do not live in a historic vacuum. And when one goes to interpret or to relay history to other people, one can't take somebody out and judge them or think, oh, well, that's so-and-so. We don't know how it happened. We just are trying to put the pieces together. So therefore, this is why I wanted, I put up here, he was born September 30th, 1857. James Buchanan had just been elected president. These are some industrialists I put up there just simply because this is what the nation was going through. I mean, we were starting to really hum. And Cornelius Vanderbilt, how, how risk is this? He sold all of his steamships, his entire fleet, and he turned everything into railroads. God, was that a great choice or what? Um, the the, yeah, and then the political upheaval, you remember the um, Compromise of 1820 and again in Compromise of 1850, we are sitting on the brink of a fireball in the night. And then Carnegie, he goes into railroads and also too, and manufacturing, and then Rockefeller, of course, gets in and he standard, standardizes, I can't say the word, uh, oil. And that's why it is called the Standard Oil Company. And he is big into oil. So that's kind of what was going on. Here, this is the area, let me see, yes. This is the area of Chester County where he was born, right in here. Let me come over here. Let's see, I can show you. It is, it is right around Union ARP Church, which has been there for for a long time, generations of his family, when they first came to America, they settled here on a King's Land grant and then just stayed. Um, let's see, this is the, a picture of the original log cabin where he was born. And it, it was down near, how many people know where Union ARP Church is? Anybody? Oh good, 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 thankfully. And then Harmony Baptist Church. Oh, there you go. Well, he was kind of right in between where, where this was. And, and it was, here again, handed down through generations. And this is where, so in 1969, the Chester Historical Society decided, hey, you know what we're gonna do? We're going to preserve this cabin because it's known as the Cherry Elliott Cabin. So they decided that we're gonna dismantle it and take it apart and move it. And they did, thankfully. But unfortunately, they moved it to Brightonsville and it was in a shed and rotted. And because funds were not available to put it back together. I wish I had known. I'm not sure what I could have done, but anyway. <laughs> um, and this is a picture of the actual cabin. Notice this is much later with the basketball go along the side. <laughs> it, it adapted. <laughs> you know, don't have a concrete driveway, but we got to side the house. Um, but anyway, so, and then this is, they're buried. These are his parents, William, Cherry. Now, I'm still working on this because there are five Williams buried in this cemetery. Do you think we like the name? Yes. Um, and then his wife was Ann Montgomery. She actually came to Newberry in a, about, um, let's see, 1819. Unfortunately, her husband or her father died when she was about three years old. And, but her mother raised her and all, and then they moved to Newberry and up to Newberry, they moved to Chester, and then that's where they met and got married. 
Um, this is Union, of course. It has burned a couple of times, and, but they have rebuilt it and it's there now. Very, very old. And then, as you know, the cemetery is off to, if you're looking at it, the cemetery is off to the left side. Yes, and very old cemetery. One thing I need to, I apologize, I forgot. If you have a question, you stop me. This is casual. And I had rather answer your question because I want you to understand and if, but, and here's the old school teacher here. Um, chances are if you have a question, there are probably about three or four more people out there who got questions too. So do not hesitate to stop me. Um, this, I am excited to tell you, is a letter. I actually have the original letter where William Cherry is writing to a loved one on the birth of his son, James Milton. And it's dated October the 2nd, 1957. So he was just born at 18. 18, I apologize. Thank you, Lee. That's why Lee is sitting right here. <laughs> And, um, and, but the, the funniest thing about it um, that I think is so funny is right here. Um, let's see, like to hear things, but nothing's wrong. Oh, that, that they went to a frolic the day before, and nothing is wrong or anything, but the circumstances surrounding was that you have a new grandson. And it was born on the 30th of September, about daylight. Anne was pretty bad, but now she's doing a lot better. <laughs> and 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 um, she has and her mother's been staying with us since last Monday, and is a it is a very large infant. <laughs> so they they wanted me to weigh it, but I did not think it was necessary, <laughs> and did not do it. He looks like it is always hungry. <laughs> so, so this is this is real. This is not just you know somebody out there. And I, I just I cherish these letters that we have. Um, let's see, did, did it flip? Nope. Okay, this is him when he was about four years old, and. He, he welcomed a brother, John, uh, William John Cherry, see, there you go again, you know, um, in January of 59. And William eventually moved to Rock Hill. This chair is that chair over there. And what they used to do once upon a time, and that's why you see chairs like this, but they they will cut the legs off so it had some more legs but as they grow they cut the legs off i know i don't know why they do, but that's what they do but anyway that's his chair so glad, excited to have that let's see okay so remember his he's born in 57 his um brother is born in january of 59 and 61 Confederate troops start firing on Fort Sumter. Union forces surrender. His father leaves and goes to war for four, five years. Get, well, four years. Gets back in 1865. He is left, she is left, with two young sons. This is actually Charleston and the way it looked at the end of the Civil War. There was massive destruction, massive. I have letters where in order to get salt, what they did was they um, boil, cut up the wood from the smokehouse and they boiled it down just to, to get the salt off of the logs from the smokehouse where they salted the hams and hung them up. But they survived. She ended up going and having to get what is known as an oath of allegiance. She had to go and sign off on the fact that she would not support the Confederacy anymore and she had to do this in order to get food for her children. So William 
is growing up and he's way out in Chester County. Food is scarce. He's got this great cabin. He's got a great family. But at 14, he decides, I've had enough of this. And in the meantime, unfortunately, Anne's sister, her husband passes away. And she is left with two small children. And she moves in to the log cabin. So I'm sure it's getting kind of crowded. <laughs> and there are mouths to feed. He's 14. So he lights out, literally, and walks to Rock Hill. And when he gets there, he has no clue what he's going to do. And he goes and he ends up working for Captain um, Davis as a clerk. He obviously had some school, we're, I'm not sure, I don't know if Lee might know, some schooling from his mother's hand or somewhere his father, but somewhere along the way he knew his numbers. And then it, he also, at the same time he attended, um, or he was a clerk, he also was going to the graded school here in Rock Hill part-time school, part-time whatever. But Mr. Davis let him sleep in the storeroom so that in exchange for being his clerk. And Mr. Davis was really good to him. And this is another mover and shaker, James Morrow Ivy. In 1869, his father-in-law in North Carolina dies. Mr. Ivy sees no more reason to stay there, so he moves to Rock Hill, South Carolina, and he establishes himself as a merchant. It was a mercantile shop. Later on, he's going to get into cotton and his cotton factory, but right now he's a merchant, and he's known as the father of Rock Hill. He, you name it, he did it. He was an inspiration, a mentor. J.M. Cherry could not have done it without him. But anyway, J.M. Cherry goes to work for him as his chief clerk, and his, Mr. Um, Ivy had a bank, and then he also worked for him as a bookkeeper in his cotton office. So he is focused on this bookkeeping and clerking. Mr. Ivy um, sees something, something in him, and as a result, sends him to the Eastman School of Business in Poughkeepsie, New York. He goes up there. These are actual flyers from that time. It was established originally in 1855. But he goes there and he hones his skills of bookkeeping and clerking and economics and enterprise and kind of like a young men's business finishing school maybe and then he comes back to Rock Hill and in 1880 at 24 years old this is hard to I mean, imagine he and other investors start the young men's loan and trust company and here's a here's a pamphlet here are the directors I think I've got this in my notebook over there um, and Let's see, and then it was reorganized as a savings bank in 1886, and Cherry managed the bank as its cashier or treasurer. You will never see, well, except for a couple of times, but you will never see him as president. He is comfortable with his ledgers and his letters. He wants to know his numbers. He wants to know what's going on. And what is remarkable to me is his, his vision, but not only his vision and his thinking ahead, but buddy, he is disciplined, he is determined, and he is diligent about his numbers, and he gets it right. Whether she was up here visiting her sister, or whether he had other business opportunities in Charleston, he meets, falls in love with Ella Mubry Davis. This is a picture of her house. It is a now a parking lot in Charleston. Um, it is at the corner of what Meeting and Hudson. She was one, I tell you we do girls, 
She is one of eight children, seven girls, one boy. And unfortunately, he dies very young of tuberculosis. So that's here again why there's no cherries. Um, they actually get married here in Rock Hill. Okay, let me help, stay with me now. Ebenezer Road, put food line on your right. Okay, go down, um, not too much further, but there is, I think there's a spa or something, Baloo, help me. What? Um, that was where her sister, Alice Alston Davis, lived and um, she, she married, let's see, help me, she married Butler Alston. Yeah, Butler Alston. She was Alice David Mary Butler Alston. This is their wedding invitation by hand. How about that? Isn't that cool? <laughs> and so they, and then they were married by James Spratt White, who was the minister at First Presbyterian Church. So. Is that building still there? Yes, it is. Oops. How do you go back? Trista. Oh, top one. That's a great question. That's what I'm trying to remember. It, I think it, there's a... It, yes. What, what is the name? It starts with a B. It's like B E. It was a gift shop and then it was something else and now it's there. Right. So it's um, down past... Is it, is it past Tall Oaks Apartments or... But it's long in there, but it's on it's on the same side of the road as Food Line, but it's on down. The address is. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. It is the address nowadays is 1804 Ebenezer Road. So very very old house. That's great. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. Um, this is actually a watercolor that a friend did of theirs when they got married and gave to them. So, here again, he hasn't had an incident with a mule yet. Okay. <laughs> um, this is their formal wedding portrait right here. So they first reside on Johnston Street, then they move to Hampton Street and reside there. Understand they're on what, the south end of, of the railroad tracks. And then finally, in 1895, through a town and site company, they cut this new development, new sub-development. And it's called Oakland Park. We'll get to that in a minute. But anyway, so he builds his house on the corner of Wilson and Oakland Avenue. It's gone now, unfortunately. But, oh, th I'll get back to that. So they got married up here. Her family's from Charleston. So they go down to Charleston and they have a big soiree, or they call it a hop. <laughs> and it made the Charleston Post and Courier. <laughs> Remember how they used to put engagements and weddings and everything in the paper? Now, now it's just like, I guess, Facebook, whatever. Um, but anyway, um, some of the, but the people who attended were Leroy Springs and, and Mr. Ivy helped organize the senior managers of the hop uh, and the <coughs> committee and all that. That's pretty neat. Um, so here, here again, this is it. he built this house. If you go down Wilson and right behind the house, there are some apartments now. But once upon a time, there weren't. This, right now, which is actually being redone, is his carriage house. This is where he kept his carriages and his horses. I never, um, I just thought, man, you got a carriage house right behind your house. How wonderful could that be with horses right there you're back in your backyard? Um, but anyway, and Cherry Bynum, who is my dad's first cousin, said, would tell me tales, because she knew I loved horses, that those horses, the stalls were just sleek, they were cobblestone, and they had the, 
um, cast iron stalls in between with the bricks and they were really nice. That would have been nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, also, this is another, he, he was a, a designer and he enjoyed different things. These stones, okay, I don't know where they came from. I've heard about four different stories. One, one story is they were quarried right here in Rock Hill in a quarry near Ebenezer. Ebenezerville, I have no clue. Another story is that they came from Winsboro. It's granite, and Winsboro is known for its granite. Um, another story is from a quarry in Union. But anyway, it's there. He must have paid a pretty penny for it because in the deed, there is a deed restriction that whoever owns that property, you got to keep the wall up. <laughs> so anyway, so recently the city of Rock Hill and the property owner got together and they, one wall just fell in, but, any, but it's there, it's beautiful. I think I, my children, when um, you can see how it goes like this and, and it's straight back, we used to go up here, we used to live down on the other end of Oakland, and they used to go up here and they called it the bread wall because it looks like a loaf of bread. <laughs> so, these are his three children. This is my grandmother, Anna. She's the oldest. This is my other cousins on the other side, the Bynums. She was born in 1887, and then Amanda, and it's Davis, Amanda Davis Cherry, um, unfortunately died within the first year of, um, she had the flu, and she could not, it, it was an aw often found thing where children would not make it through the first year of life. But anyway, that's, that, those were his girls. <laughs> um, what, okay, now we're going to get into the businesses. And I might go through this a little bit quicker. I don't, I don't know how he kept up with it. I really do not know how he kept up with it, but he did. And, and he wasn't by himself. Oh, trust me, he had all kind of buddies. Um, Fred Fairchild sitting back that there, as quiet as I've ever seen you. Um, <laughs> One of his big cohorts was W.B. Wilson, who is Fred's great-grandfather. And, um, but anyway, but this is what, starting out with Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson and Mr. Holler, who he was, Mr. Holler was Anderson's father-in-law. They started the buggy company in 1886. They, they were doing well, but they wanted to expand. And so in, uh, this is a picture of the buggy company. Right there, you, you know where the plaque is, right where the bleachery is today. And this is the buggy in the State Museum. I think Gary's got one. I think he does, maybe. Um, it was a, they were either painted red or yellow. You could take your choice <laughs> of, of colors. And, and also, you could have long shafts or you could have short shafts, <laughs> depending on how big your horse was. And you could have a three-seater. You could have a Surrey with the fringe on top. You could have a work service buggy. You could have um, a nicer carriage for outings in, to go to parties or soirees. So, but the thing was, and Mr. Anderson and Mr. Cherry had, had a contentious, I think that's the best word, relationship. Um, yes, I hear you chuckling. I know y'all know the backstory. Uh, so in 1892, Mr. Hutch, uh, Mr. Anderson decided to expand. So they sold stock, and they sold it to Holler, his father-in-law, David Hutchison, Mr. Roddy, ten other shares to different people. He only had one share. That's all he needed. So over time. Cherry bought Hollers, he bought Hutchison's, and he acquired the other 10. He now owned two-thirds of the company that Mr. Anderson started. That did not sit well. So what he did, 
Mr. Anderson came to him and said, you know, I kind of started the company and I'm working and yet I'm not making what I thought I would be making. And he, and Mr. Cherry, was that was the company he was president of. He said, well, what, what's going to make you happy? And he said, well, I need you to sell me the shares to make me 50-50 so we can be 50-50. So he did. He sold it to him at a price. And he said, he later goes on to say um, that Mr. Cherry was the, a luxury in the company. But the deal was, Mr. Anderson was a genius when it came to manufacturing and putting the parts together and the floor management and the whole nine yards. He got it. Mr. Cherry's niche was the books and the letters and he kept it going. And that's unfortunately was the big breakup was when it was over a production issue and Mr. Cherry wanted to see how many they could churn out. Mr. Anderson wanted to see how luxurious they could be or high end. And so they parted ways and Mr. Anderson bought him out. Um, this is my grandfather in one of those Surreys. And this is a, I wish this house was still standing. This is known as the Whitner House. Mr. Whitner was vital in the uh, getting together, damming up um, Lake Wiley, working with Mr. Wiley, but he came and, but anyway, this was his house on Oakland Avenue. But, um, and then Mr. Anderson, yes, he had to run up the street from where the bleachery is. He had to run up the street to the depot. He got tired of doing that. And so he went, he called this guy in Sumter, well not called him, I think he wrote him or went down there. He got this guy in Sumter and he came back and he wired himself a telephone. <laughs> he did. And so they, they were in partnership in the telephone company along with some others and a Mr. Workman and Mr. Smith and finally um, some bought out and one thing and another but this is just here again, what is he? He's got his eye on that bottom line. This is, oh, this is the big deal. This is the, he starts this company called the um, Rock Hill Land and Town Site Company. I have to stop and think about that. Um, and they sold shares in it. And this company, and Fred's great grandfather was a part of it, Mr. Hutchison and Roddy and, let me think. There are two other people. And they, oh, so Fred's great-grandfather was out in Oakland, California. And he, and he gets a hold of Cherry, telegraph says, you got to see this. You're not going to believe this. You got to come out here. So, of course, he jumps on the train, goes out there. He is absolutely overwhelmed with the way that it's grid, it's laid out, it's beautiful, it's got buildings, it's got residential, but most of all it has parks and areas for people to gather. He comes, they come back, and you know what they do? They cut Oakland Avenue and they make sure that it is plenty of place for people to stay and to have fun and to leisurely be. This is one of my favorite letters. Notice he's crossing lines here. He's writing from the buggy company, but this is about Oakland Park. But anyway, he hears, he wants this park to be gorgeous. He wants trees and flowers and this and that and the other. And so he writes this new person he's learned about in New York. This person's name is Mr. Olmstead. Yeah, some of you know. Who do you tell me? Wise started the thing over in Western North Carolina, right? Yes. The big one. <laughs> the big one. Yes. So interesting. In this letter, Grandpa Cherry writes him and says, "You know, I've got about 50 acres. I need you to come down and look at it. I want you. I want to have plans. I want you to do something with it. And one thing and another." Mr. Olmstead um, says writes him back this lengthy four-page letter and says, you know what, um, because 
he has just finished Central Park. <laughs> okay? And he said, I've got a little job down in Asheville. It's called the Biltmore. <laughs> and I think I'm going to come down there. And I've also got a chance to work on something in Atlanta and Augusta. But, and so they write back and forth. And then Mr. Olmstead's plans change. And he says, but you know what? I don't know that, and Grandpa Pateria here again, watching that bottom line, because the, the second letter that Mr. Olmstead writes back, he details what he's going to charge. <laughs> and Grandpa was like, mm, I'm not sure about this. But, but he also, Mr. Olmstead also introduces this other person who's down in Augusta and says, why don't you contact him and get him to come up and look? And so he does. The reason he was down in Augusta? I can't say his last name. Lee, can you say those names? It's Brecken, Brecken anyway. Okay, um, it, it, it's over there in the, um, it's called Augusta National. <laughs> so that, this is why he had envisioned in front of Winthrop University, he had, in, you know how the, they have the islands in the middle of the street? It was supposed to continue all the way down, but it didn't. And let's see if we can, well, so also, this is um, Winthrop University. Now, here again, this group of men. In eight, let's see, let me get my dates right. 1891, there is a girls' school in Columbia. And the state says, hey, we're going to send this out. We're going we're gonna to bid this up. We're going to see who wins the bid. So all these cities in South Carolina are bidding for this woman's college. Winthrop's normal and industrial college. And so several cities start bidding. But interestingly enough, here in Rock Hill, we had two contractors, two land companies bidding. One was Mr. Iredale at Steel Creek Farms, actually about right here, right, right where we were, because Iredale's right there, the road. Um, they come up, they actually, people in the legislature never even heard of Rock Hill. They go, Rock what? And so they come up um, and they tour the city. And the land and town site company sweetened the deal by saying, we're going to put $700 on the table. 700 I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but it was 1891. $700 on the table. Steel Farms come back, and we'll put $700 on the table, too. And we're like, oh, man. So I will say, Mr. Wilson wanted this so bad. <laughs> I mean, so bad. He threw in everything he had. Mr. Tillman, governor at the time, came up and Tillman said, I want that land right there. That's where I want it. <laughs> Mr. Will was like, uh, that's my land. <laughs> and they were like, well, it's either your land or no school. He gives them the land. Gives them 30 acres of his land that he had pegged out. And he goes back now. I really would not like for him. I would really love to hear that conversation with his wife when he went home and told her that. <laughs> um, she also had to entertain Ms. Tillman, and they had had, um, they, they weren't on the same page, put it that way. But she got over that and entertained Ms. Tillman. Still, they said, well, how are we going to do this? How, how are we going to have the money to do this? And they said, the city said, well, I tell you what we'll do, we'll sell bonds. We'll sell $60,000 worth of bonds. And they said, well, okay, but we got to know because th this is really going to happen or else, you know, it's not going to happen. What does he do? Mr. Wilson goes back and Cherry and they converse with the other partners in the group and they said, okay, okay, we'll buy all $60,000 worth of bonds. And they do. And that's why Winthrop is there today. 
unbelievable. I mean, what? So, but also, they also give land right down the street, right across the street actually, for Stewart Avenue, um, for Oakland Avenue Presbyterian Church in 1912 to make sure that these ladies who are at Winthrop have the religious and moral guidance that they need. <laughs> so that's why Oakland Avenue was established. They gave 375,000 bricks and they also gave the clay to make another two million more bricks. So big, in, oh, the, the land and town site company, thank you. Yes, yeah, so big buy-in, big, big buy-in. And Chip and I were talking during break and saying, can you imagine Winthrop not being there? Not being there at all, anyway. So um, this is, of course, the president, president's house as it was, as it is. <laughs> How about that? Um, yes, very, very different. Um, then there's, oh, oh no, ARP. Okay, so in 1896, so this is the tie-in. Arthur Ro Small Rogers was a seminary student. He graduated from seminary, came back to Rock Hill, he is an offshoot of Union ARP. Those ARPs, you know, they stick together. I, can, I tell you, trust me, my husband's one. Um, and so they tried to raise funds and tried to raise funds and tried to raise funds for these ARPs to get together and build this church. And they finally had the funds. And so what, what happened was that Mr. Rogers and his sister Cora were niece and nephew of Anne Cherry down in Richburg and when her when their mother passed away Anne and William Cherry were left to raise them and so as a tribute to William and Anne Cherry um, James Milton and William Cherry paid the balance of the fundraising and gave this window in memory of their parents. So, um, but let's see. Yeah, here we go. It's in memory of William Cherry and Anne Montgomery. It's it. They call it the front of the church, but it's to me it's the back. But anyway, but that's how that's there, and that's the family connection. Um, this is the great, I love this. this so they've, they've cut this huge new subdivision. Okay, what are we going to do now? We're going to light it. We're going to have water, running water, and we're going to have sewer. Not, not before this. So they get it together and they form another company. <laughs> and they call it the Rock Hill Water Light and Power Company. Oh my gosh, so we're running, we're running the buggy company, we're running the traction company, we're running this company. I mean, Lee and I, I think Lee, Lee and I listed maybe about eight or ten companies all at the same time. And if you get a chance, I have put out over here in year order, there are letters by years from, let's see, what is it, um, from the, the from 1898 to 1909. And the reason I did that is I want, if you had a chance to go through and read some of them, he is at that desk every day. Every day writing letters, writing, 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 writing. And also in front of the letters are the ledgers from the companies. And you can see by hand, by hand, he is figuring interest at the bank, he is figuring how much he's got to borrow, and he and, and one of the letters says that he's, I, I, Mr. So-and-so from a bank in New York, I want to borrow this much money to capitalize so-and-so, I am the pres or vice president of the bank, but I just don't feel right borrowing from that bank. So 
here again, but it's all the time. It's writing letters, you know, no, no email, no tel, you know, well, telephone, but eh, sort of maybe. Or Facebook. No, no Facebook. Forget that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, he also, in 1890 and 1891, was mayor of Rock Hill. And this is, I have his desk when he was mayor. And it still has, it still has over here the little drawers and the names of the companies. All the names of the companies. Here again, 1890, he's still looking at his two eyes. Okay. Oh, sorry. Oh, gosh. Okay, back. Back. I'm sorry. Oh, the box. Yeah, there's the box. That's his money box. Yeah, I'm guaranteed. He went. Huh? Yeah, really. <laughs> um, so, yeah, he had his own money box. He carried that around. So, I, I just thought that was kind of neat. Um, yeah, I guess that was his traveling bank. Maybe that was his, I don't know what you would call it, Dave, his debit card. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, and then this is a brass plaque when they were de de demolishing one of the um, buildings downtown. They found it and a cousin has it, but it is a brass plaque and it's the Carolina Traction Company. What that was, that's a weird name, isn't it? Um, but what, it, what it, like when you get traction or something and you move, it is actually, it started off as a steam vehicle as a steam trolley. Well, that didn't work too well. And m m more people, it talks about the people getting off of, and pushing it up, uh, you know, the hill at Oakland Avenue. Um, a lot of you don't remember, but I used to love going down Oakland Avenue and, and, and right, you go at the overhead bridge now, but you go down this huge hill and then cross the railroad tracks and you go straight up. Oh my gosh, and if you hit it just right, you could just pop right over the tracks, you know. But anyway, so, um, but this is some of the stock for the traction company. And so it, this traction company evolved. And the steam engine didn't work. So they were looking at electricity, but they were having trouble with all the lines and everything. Not to be outdone. He has two mules in the meantime until he gets electricity. This is a lack and this is trick. Electric. <laughs> he had electric cars. Um, dry sense of humor too, probably. But anyway, um, they then they went from this to rate. Oh, I'm sorry. Where I apologize. Yes. Oh gosh. Okay, give me an approximate. Approximately. Um, Since 1895. Yeah. yeah that's really probably about 18 yeah 1895 everything happens basically between 86 and about um, 19 um, 19 what 20 well he, he's he's going by then but started everything about 1886 and then final company I think comes into being about 1912 but anyway um, yeah so they have actual rail lines and, but the, the neatest thing, is this the next one? Yes, down Main Street. How cool was that? Ran all the way down Main Street, down Oakland Avenue, because you got to take the girls back and forth to town for them to shop and everything. And then, and, but it ran on uh, battery storage. The former of Tesla. How about that? <laughs> That's who he was communicating with. How about that? Crazy, huh? Um, this, he, he also sometimes didn't like what people wrote about his company, so fine. He just <laughs> built his own newspaper, you know. <laughs> um, and it, it was the Chronicle. It was later bought out by the Lantern, which is Mr. Ivy's, and then it later became the Herald. This is the York County Fair Association, that large area parking lot, if you will, where the um, Winthrop, University parks their cars where the old AMVETS place used to be. Lee, tell, tell them what y'all used to be able to do, we used to be able to do. Which going to the fair. Oh yeah, they charge for going to the fair. <laughs> <laughs> why, why? Well, and this is why, 
that when the fair because he because he wanted everybody to bring their commerce to town and, and um, 1908 he is a delegate to the Democratic Convention in Colorado he is always curious he is always what is the next thing he's going to do he goes out there and he finds this new crop it's called alfalfa it's like what is alfalfa well Anybody who has horses knows that alfalfa is like premium hay. You can only feed them about this much. It's incredibly high in protein and not much fat. Gives them lots of energy. But the unfortunate problem is that it grows in a very mild climate. So he thought, okay, well I could do this because he's already growing cotton and corn. So he comes back and he starts growing. He puts Cherry Road into alfalfa. I tell you, this man is at the right place at the right time. And about four years later, World War I breaks out in Europe. And of course, the army is running on alfalfa. So, because of the horses, they're... And here, here the government contract, they're in trucks, loaded down with alfalfa. Pretty cool. Cherry Road. Cherry Road. The beginnings of Cherry Road. This is how it was. It was just a, a, a I mean, just a farm road. One, um, in, in about 18, let me think, 18, 1880, he had the opportunity to buy a large expanse of land. He bought the land all the way from the Catawba River all the way to what is now the uh, York County Natural Gas Company in a foreclosure sale. Pennies on the dollar. Pennies on the dollar. He's probably about 30, 32 at this time and also the land on both sides of Cherry Road. This is where he is running his agricultural operation. This is Cherry Farms, not to be whatever with all the other stuff. Um, he decides that, you know what, these people really need a route from, because once upon a time, um, back in the 50s, there was a ferry. There was no Catawba River Bridge. You got, you got across to Fort Mill on a ferry. And so no bridge, no nothing. So you needed a path to get to Fort Mill and on to Charlotte for trade. And, and so that's why he bought this and he cut this road and it was a farm road for a long, long time. And then he said, okay, you know what, we need to pave this road. And he went to the city and he said, can you help me pave this road? Can you help me cut it? Can you help me grade it? No, we're not interested. Private road, go for it. He said, well, but, you know, everybody could use it. No, go to the county, ask them the same thing. No, we're not interested. Private road, frustrated. He cuts it himself. He grades it. And all of a sudden they're thinking, mm, we might need to rethink this. <laughs> and so, they still won't buy it from him. And I think out of frustration, he just gives it to them. And he also gives them the concrete to pave it. Because he realizes that it is for the good of Rock Hill. And that was his thing. He had intent, purpose in what he did for the good of the entire community. Here they are working on the road, grading it. Here he is. I love this picture. This is, oh, y'all will know this. This is at the corner of Charlotte Avenue. Are you ready? So if you're, if you're in this car, this is Starbucks. Okay? <laughs> and this, this is the little cafe and Earth Fair. How about that? So, and this is, so he's coming down Charlotte Avenue and he's looking at, and this is all his crops and everything. This is his barn, huge, huge barn. And he actually had two barns, one for 
mules and horses and everything, and one for his um, equipment that he used. And so, let's see. You know, this would never pass zoning or planning or permitting. But this is the plan for Cherry Road. <laughs> These are the permits. <laughs> this is the engineer drawing. <laughs> I just think that's cool, but it but it lays it out Cherry Road and then um, oh they didn't call it Cherry Road they called it Cement Road <laughs> Cement Road it just came to be Cherry Road but once once he had cemented it you know it's like oh that Cement Road you know that Mr Cherry did and that's it why how it got its name but but he's doing this and it's Milton Avenue and all that but. It became the first road, first concrete road in South Carolina, and I think one of the first three in the state of South Carolina um, to be paved. There, there's another drawing. It's a little more exact. It's got numbers on it. <laughs> um, this is an invitation he received to go have lunch with Teddy Roosevelt. I wish I had been there. Um, but at, with, at the governor's mansion in... Did he go? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Even though he's Republican and you said James Jerry was Democrat? Well, you know, Chip, I think that... I don't know that we were as divisive back then. You know? He was still the president. You know? And um, anyway, and this was the invitation. And then... Oh my gosh, can you imagine? So his daughter had gone to Chicora College which, in Columbia, which would later become Queens College and move to Charlotte. But she went to finishing school at the Hamilton School in Washington, D.C. And because of, I guess, connections or whatever, she is actually invited to the inaugural ball and at the White House. Here is her menu for the night. <laughs> these are this is these are the bands who are going to play. How about that? I know. And what is so interesting, Lee was saying like, God, I don't know. I, I'm sorry, I'm going to tell on you. Um, <laughs> it, the fact that it, I think it, it starts at like 8:30, and you go through all these menus and all this, that, and the other, and it's not over. The dancing really doesn't commence until about 11 o'clock. <laughs> so, and, and this is, this is her dance card. You remember dance cards? Anybody remember dance cards? <laughs> and, the, and these are the songs that you're going to play and these are the dances that you need to know how to dance <laughs> in order to dance. And this, uh, no, and this, um, she was hedging her bets, but anyway, uh, she, um, this is the outside of the little booklet or dance card or whatever. Um, this is when he actually retired as cashier of the bank. They had a big um, retirement party, I guess. This was the menu. And these were the officers and the attendees. Let's see, what is this? Oh, this is getting now. I'm gonna get emotional now. <laughs> No, this is fine. This is my favorite letter of all times. Um, this is actually my grandmother. He's writing her November 20th of 1920. It's because it's such an intimate letter and she is in Winsboro. She has all of her children, yes, and they want her back. They want her back in Rock Hill. His other daughters live in right beside him. He wants his grandchildren, he wants to see them, he wants to be with his daughter. So he's in a, in a very um, uh, soft way saying, now, I'm not trying to tell you what to do, <laughs> but your mama wants you back in town. <laughs> and, and you know, we don't really need this big house anymore. So why don't you and James, that was her husband, why don't y'all come on back and just take it and we'll, we'll go somewhere else. We'll, you know, we'll figure something else out. Unfortunately, 
it never happens because less than a month later he dies. And he dies by, we don't know, maybe my cousins or have a better story or understanding of what happened, but he had an accident where he is either hit by a wooden post or he hits his head on the wooden post, doesn't think it's all that big a deal, three days later he's dead. He dies of sepsis in Charlotte at the hospital. But these are resolutions the city puts out um, and also the, the Rotary Club, which he was a member. This is Mr. Draper, one of the landscape architects of the time. He had worked with him. He, Mr. Draper later becomes the city manager in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, yes, sorry. Well, get up and tell them, please. Oh, okay, so Lee said that Mr. Draper also was the architect, landscape architect, who laid out Myers Park. And Laurelwood Cemetery. And Laurelwood Cemetery. Thank y'all. Yes. Um, he believed in hard work, but he also believed in playing hard. And his vision was people should have space and room to play and enjoy nature. He believed in education and recreation. This was pounded into our brains when we were little. I, I, know, I, see, I see my cousin shaking their heads. It was pounded into our brains by our parents and by our grandparents that you work hard and you play hard. And he wanted to leave a lot of space for people. This is a letter I have from my grandfather He's got five boys and one girl. He's got to send to college. It is 1934. Okay, what's he gonna do? What would Grandpa Papa Cherry would have done? He sells 100 acres. It's called the college farm. And he, set, and he sends his sons to Davidson and his daughter to Winthrop. So this is where education and recreation, before then they used it to play and hunt and everything, but his children had to be have an education. This is where they, city council names Cherry Park. Um, Cherry Park, we had no idea, of, I mean, I didn't. I mean, it, it just, they just did, and we were grateful. We had no clue what they would name it. Um, but yes, oh, that, <laughs> so, so the, the land along Eden, I, I hear Lee say, yes, yes, that's right. Okay, the land along Eden Terrace. Let's see, from, what is that? Myrtle. From Myrtle out to Mount Gallant. He left, here again, deed restriction. It could not be developed, it had to be used for recreation or education. That's why Miracle Park is there. That's why Cherry Park is there. That's why originally Rockville High, but is now Sullivan, is there. because the city and the school district kept swapping it back and forth until one of them figured out what they were going to do with it. But um, before he died in 1917, of that massive amount of land that he bought, he sold a thousand acres in an auction. People came from Florida, New York, all the way to the Mississippi River, and developers bought up land up and down on both sides of Cherry Road. He retained 500 acres and this is what, I'm um, sorry, the, um, this is part of the five, this is 100 acres of the 500 acres that my grandfather sold in order to put his children through college. And then in honor 
of everything Mr. Ivy had done for him at being such a great mentor and putting him under his wing, he left what we grew up knowing as the tot lot there. I mean, that's what we called it um, on Charlotte Avenue. And then that's why here again, Cherry Park Elementary, we had no idea. It was, but um, Oh, and this is where we, we actually, I think some of my other cousins got together and got a sign, asked for a sign, and put it up there where the house was, and then we had a reception. And that's it, I think, yep, that's it.